Mars, lonely red planet, between 55 and 400 million kilometers from Earth, depending on where it is in its orbit. The winters at its polar regions can reach a hellish minus 125 degrees Celsius. With an unbreathable atmosphere, 95% carbon dioxide, and 2.7% nitrogen. And all of that, only 1% as dense as Earth. It is completely unbreathable, and so thin, that to a human, it might as well not be there. It is a world of red sand dunes and deserts, and vast mountains and highlands that often rival those of Earth and canyons so deep that the largest and greatest of our world could be lost in them. Looking out over this cold, dry desert at dawn fills one with a certain intuition there can be no life here. But over the last 10 years, new evidence has emerged that there may well be water beneath the sands of Mars. And due to radioactivity at the planet's surface, it may be warmer underground as well. If so, could there be life? Could there be a Martian ecology? And what can we learn from it? But answering those questions introduces the dilemma. Just how do we get there? To pry open Mars secrets, I mean, at up to several hundred million kilometers away, getting there isn't going to be any canoe trip. Or maybe we can get there by canoe, at least via the vessel of the mind's eye. But it's going to be a long trip. So perhaps along the way, a little background about Mars. Mars can easily be seen from Earth with the naked eye, appearing as a red star somewhere in the sky. Where it is in the sky, though, will vary because it is a planet, and the word planet literally means wanderer. Since ancient times, astronomers knew the planets were different from other stars because they moved about the sky. And Mars has two moons named Phobos and Deimos, interesting names that mean panic and fear. They are tiny though, little more than a pair of captured asteroids. And given how close Mars is to the asteroid belt, it is no wonder that from time to time it captures a wandering asteroid, holding it in stable orbit, at least for a while. One Martian year is nearly two Earth years, or just about 687 days. A Martian day, or Sol, is not too different from an Earth day, 24 hours, 37 minutes, and 22 seconds. Due to the slight but significant variation, it is simpler just to refer to a Martian day as a Sol. The diameter of Mars is 6,779 kilometers, making it just about one half the diameter of Earth. But the mass of Mars is quite a bit lower than Earth, being about 11% of our world. Just large enough and massive enough to be considered a planet, Mars is on the far outer edge of our system's Goldilocks zone. This means that even if Mars were a water world with a very dense atmosphere, it would still be a very cold place to visit. And planetologists estimate that its climate would have been something like we might find in Alaska or Iceland today. But even though today Mars is cold and dry, it remains the most Earth-like of all the other planets in our star system. Mars shows many signs of having been covered with water in the past. And it still has vapor clouds, ice at the poles, and very likely subterranean lakes. Naturally, Mars' many similarities with Earth make it very interesting. Liquid water is considered essential for all life as we know it, and in one way or another, nearly all NASA's probes to the planet have looked for it. But on November 26, 2011, NASA took that hunt to a whole new level. NASA sent Curiosity, a nuclear-powered probe that is resistant to the dust that kills solar-powered probes over time. Its mission is to explore a 96-mile diameter crater called Gale, a three and a half billion year old formation with a mountain at its center. Chosen because it showed evidence of erosion indicating this entire region had once been a lake. Curiosity hit the Martian atmosphere at 21,000 kilometers per hour. It was slowed by way of friction on heat shields. But the Martian atmosphere is so thin that unlike on Earth, that just is not enough to slow a spacecraft adequately. So she deployed a gigantic supersonic speed rated parachute the largest ever made, but even that was not enough to slow Curiosity adequately. It was a big and heavy rover, the size of an SUV. So for the final leg of the descent, a sky crane was deployed, which used retro rockets to slow the craft down. The sky crane brought Curiosity to a complete stop, hovering only a few meters over the ground. Then the sky crane lowered the rover by cable for the last of the descent. The entire process had to be automated because Mars is so far away that radio signals between Mars and Earth would take 24 minutes to make a round trip. 
Thus, the entire process had to be handled by the ship's onboard automated computers. And the competent engineers of NASA pulled it off perfectly. The sky crane lowered the craft safely to the surface of Mars, then ascended, rocketed away, and crashed at some distance with the last of its fuel. Once she was safely on the ground, an extended period of checks began, and then finally, the eager scientists could get around to serious study of the Martian world. Over the next few months, the Curiosity rover did indeed confirm historic evidence of erosion within the crater, and also the presence of rock formations that could only be created within a watery environment. I figured since I had paddled all the way to Mars, I might as well get a selfie with the Curiosity rover. At some time in the past, this crater had indeed been a lake. And in 2015, data came in from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter confirming that water does in fact still flow on Mars from time to time when the conditions are right. When the atmospheric temperature is above minus 23 degrees Celsius, evidence of ongoing erosion can be found on the surfaces of some mountain ranges on Mars. All the while, on the surface in the Gale Crater, the Curiosity rover acted on its mission, follow the water, and looking for evidence of past or present microbial life. And what Curiosity has found so far has been nothing short of amazing. Not only has Curiosity been able to confirm that for an extensive period of time liquid water flowed on Mars, but the soil ingredients contain, and still contain, the ingredients that life requires. Carbon, sulfur, nitrogen, and other elements necessary for the chemistry of life. And in 2019, Curiosity was able to confirm the presence of clay in the soil. That is another remarkable bit of evidence because clay is formed through the eroding action of water on stone. Very interestingly, Curiosity also observed plumes of methane. On Earth, methane is the byproduct of the activities of life, though certain geological processes can also cause it. So we can't jump the gun and say that subterranean microbial life is causing these methane emissions. But we now know this is a realistic possibility. As is so often the case, more research is needed. The Marineris Valley, a canyon as long as the North American continent is broad, a canyon so wide and deep that any side trench of it would entirely swallow an earth wonder like the Grand Canyon. We have come here in the mind's eye to experience the wonder of this remarkable place at sunrise. It is a planetary wonder grander and more magnificent than any other canyon to be found in the entire solar system. And what's more, it is in this canyon's misty, deep and sheltered trenches where Martian water is likely yet to flow. If indeed Mars still has some remnants of liquid water, it is to be found in this place. But the topography of this place is so steep and challenging that NASA has not yet dared attempt a mission into this forbidden place. Like the deepest ocean canyons of Earth, the Valles Marineris is wondrous and promising, but exploration of it is ominous. But someday we must go and explore, because if there is any place on the surface where liquid water is yet to be found, it is going to be in forbidden places such as this, deep and sheltered, where the atmospheric pressure remains the highest, and where the land can provide shielding from cosmic and solar radiation. On the upside, Exploring these areas will provide some compelling vistas. Brr, I wish I'd packed a coat. Around daytime on Mars, it might get up to 20 degrees Celsius, but at night, even at the equator, it can drop to minus 73. Hoo -hoo -hoo. Mars was once covered with an ocean of water. Of that, there can be no longer any real doubt. At the poles, landers have discovered water ice just beneath the surface, scalloping the land as it freezes and thaws. And at lower latitudes, the land has literally been carved and reshaped by the flowage of tremendous amounts of water. It is estimated that the gigantic Valles Marineris required at least a hundred Amazon rivers worth of water flowing through it to carve it out of Mars' surface. And here, at Casai Valles, is yet another old riverbed, a vast and deep artifact of an ancient time when oceans and mighty rivers flowed over the face of Mars. 
There can be no doubt that Mars was once an ocean world with an atmosphere thick and dense enough to hold water in a liquid state. Below we can see the mighty valley opening up into a broad lake. What might it have been like, I can't help but wonder, to have stood here three billion years ago and seen this world, Earth's companion planet, raining, to have experienced the rains of Mars, and perhaps to have walked among its alien gardens. Where could that vast ocean have gone? And for that matter, what happened to the once dense atmosphere that shrouded and protected this once wet and possibly living world? Today, we think we know the answer. Mars now has only an artifact of a magnetic field. But when the planet was younger and its core was hotter, its magnetic field was much stronger, shielding the planet from solar winds. But when the core cooled, its magnetic field died, and solar winds slowly stole away its atmosphere and water. Our world only did not suffer the same fate because it has by contrast a much stronger and stable magnetic field. The contrast between Earth and Mars is a stark reminder of how fragile is a living world. Mars, a world that once knew rain and oceans and rivers and water in tremendous abundance, was rendered barren by a quirk of fate and a stumbling of its magnetic field. But while one slush Mars is lost forever, there may yet be hope that there is some remnant of life, some tough microbial survivor of an ancient time, yet hidden away in its stones and soil, its caves and canyons. It was not that long ago that scientists thought life could only exist within a very narrow range of environments. Environments that were temperate, offering ready essentials such as minerals, sunlight, and abundant liquid water. But in 2018, scientists announced the discovery of massive amounts of life deep beneath Earth's surface, existing at unimaginable pressures and at temperatures as high as 120 degrees Celsius. These are ranges previously thought impossible for life, and yet there is so much life down there that if it could all be gathered up, the sum of the biomass would be greater than all of that on Earth's surface and oceans. In that impossible environment, life thrives. As Michael Crichton once wrote, Life finds a way. And if life can find a way to survive and thrive in the most inhospitable of environments of Earth, then perhaps life can find a way to thrive on pristine yet barren Mars. It is very possible in light of these discoveries that if Mars did have time to develop a biosphere and an ecology, and if its aquasphere and atmosphere were lost gradually, its life may have had time to adapt and we may yet find some form of Martian life deep under its surface or perhaps not so deep at all. For there is mounting evidence that there are places on Mars where water may exist relatively near the surface. And there are the deep ravines of Mars's massive canyons where water can remain liquid for a few hours. What all this means is that Mars is a fascinating world with a rich past that may yet harbor secrets. And the exploration of this lonely red planet is a new and essential frontier for the human species, representing the potential for new plateaus of scientific understanding. I hope life is one day found there, but even if not, the windswept vistas, the clear sky, the allure of an entirely new land makes Mars a place that will hold my interest for a while. Thank you for venturing into the cosmos with me in this episode of Sky Story. Sky Story is part of the Understory Network, a collection of programs devoted to the study of the natural world. In MicroStory, we study the invisible world of the very small. In UnderStory, we examine natural history and issues of conservation. And in SkyStory, we look beyond Earth and explore the cosmos. There will be many more episodes, so to keep abreast, please take a moment to subscribe, and don't forget to hit that like button.